Hi, I'm Mike, and this is Our Wyoming Life, and today we're looking at local food, why it's important to buy and for farmers and ranchers to sell. Local food has become a big business in America. In fact, it's become a business that's worth over $20 billion a year. For us, it's a great time to talk about local food because the entire dynamic of the ranch, well, it's changing. And the same thing is happening at hundreds, if not thousands of farms and ranches across the world. A few years ago, I made a video called The Cost of Ranching, and little did I know that by explaining how thin margins are and, and how the weather and things like drought can mean the difference between making or losing money, I was foreshadowing what was actually gonna happen here and how we would have to change or simply disappear. Look at that, I'm a poet and I didn't even know it. Over the years, I've received a number of letters and emails about farms and ranches that have been sold because they were unable to support themselves. And I hate seeing it. Even now, we're losing farmland at the rate of over a million acres a year in the United States. I also get a ton of emails about how do I get into farming and ranching, which is dang near impossible, especially nowadays in the traditional form, unless you marry a rancher's daughter or stepdaughter. And sometimes, that doesn't even work. To get an idea of where our industry is now, well, we actually have to go back, maybe 150 years. I also have chores to do, so I'm dragging you along as I do them. And if you like this video, please hit that thumbs up button and even subscribe. Follow along as we explore the ranch life and escape the ordinary. Okay, let's go. America was an innovator in farming. The, the number of farms tripled from 2 million in 1860 to about 6 million by 1906. The amount of people living on farms went from 10 million in 1860 to 22 million in 1880 and then grew even more to 31 million by the early 1900s. The value of farms grew from 8 billion in 1860 to 30 billion in 1906, and if you lined up 100 people working in the US, 70 of them were working on farms. From the cotton gin in 1793 to the McCormick Reaper and Binder in the 1830s, and even simple things like this antique hay rake, America was finding ways to feed the world, and doing things in new ways was actually helping them to do that. Then something changed. By 1850, the number of farms in the U.S. had fallen to 5 million. 2008, 2.2 million. And today, less than 2 million farms are left. They average a little over 400 acres each. Farmers and ranchers make up now a little bit over 1% of the workforce as compared to that 70% back in the late 1800s. So what did change? By the 1920s, the government took a very active role in deciding what Americans were gonna eat. World War I created a, a shortage of food throughout the world. And to meet demand, uh, the government encouraged farmers to produce more. 12 new banks were actually created out of thin air to provide loans for farm expansion, which many farmers I guess, they, I guess they took advantage of. But after the war, the demand then fell dramatically as war-torn countries, well, they recovered. The demand for U.S. exports, it fell. Drought came, and not only the Great Depression, but an agricultural depression, too. Farms, my Cracker Jack, farms began to default on their loans. The price of land fell sharply. And at a time when farmers made up 25% of the population, uh, many people left the farm and the ranch. This in turn, of course, lowered prices for farmers on their own products. While lower farm product prices, I guess, were bad for farmers, well, they were good for businesses that used farm products. All of a sudden, food became big business. Companies like General Mills began to dominate growing to what is currently, actually their sales base is about $11 billion a year in the U.S. alone. Kellogg, another company, now up to $14 billion in sales per year. In fact, now only 10 companies control most of the food you buy. That's wild to me, especially when you think that only 100 years ago, you were 
Well, if you wanted to have chicken for dinner, you went down to your local, well, you went down to your neighbor who probably raised chickens and you paid, or better yet, you traded for what you needed. The same thing happened with meat and livestock production around the U.S. Maybe even a little earlier, though. Big meat packers like JBS, which was formed in 1855, well, they learned that beef was big business. And all those big ranchers, well, they needed somewhere to sell their products. As small ranchers and farmers were selling and getting out of the business, the, the small aspect of the business was going away with it. It wasn't long before you couldn't even find somewhere to buy local beef, pork, or even vegetables. The, the Great Depression also weighed heavy on people's minds, and I don't blame them. Uh, a generation that grew up not knowing where their next meal might uh, come from now had access to supermarkets and uh, I guess a never-ending supply of food, food from all over the world. And how amazing was this? You could get a banana anytime you wanted one. We all had those grandparents who or great-grandparents that had freezers full of food, just in case. On a side note, I used to watch that show, uh, Doomsday Preppers, and think, wow, these guys are uh, a bit out there. Now, maybe not so much. Okay, so local food at this point is dying. Grocery stores are the norm. The number of farms and ranches, well, they're still falling. And in 1950, the number of farms is at 20 million. By 1970, it's down to 10 million. And in 1972, farming sees one of its last booms. The Soviet Union surprises the world when they admit they don't have enough grain to feed their own citizens. They make a super secret deal with five of the biggest American grain companies for almost 25 million tons of grain, worth today over $10 billion. All of a sudden, the Soviets buy up one quarter of the U.S. wheat crop. The price of grain shoots up, corn prices hit all-time highs, and farm income jumps from $2.3 billion in 1972 to $20 billion in 1973. Livestock producers, however, couldn't afford to feed our own herds. Millions of hogs, cattle, and chickens are sold for slaughter at rock-bottom prices. The demand then rises along with prices at the consumer end, and companies like JBS make billions. And at that time, the Russian grain purchase of 1972 was the largest grain deal between two nations in history. But it set in motion a number of changes that would dominate agricultural history to this day. The 80s rolled around and big business, well, big business was king. Companies began to form monopolies, which still exist to this day. Four companies control chicken, pork, and beef in the United States. Four corporations, AMD, Bunge, Cargill, and Dreyfus, control more than 75% of the global grain trade. And I'm sure if we were able to dive into vegetables, we'd find even more of the same. Now, this is all a very, very brief history of agriculture in the U.S. That 1% of the workforce that still farms and ranches, well, we're lucky enough to be here because things are still changing. For example, a small rancher like us can't afford to raise cattle the same way we did 100 or even 50 years ago. And we sure as hell can't afford to sell them the same way. Back there. All right, there's a quote that's attributed to Albert Einstein, who probably didn't say anything even close to this, but insanity is doing the same thing over and over and over and over again, expecting different results. Now, I should get that tattooed on my forehead. So, what do we do? Small farmers and ranchers aren't able to make a living, and if they are, it's really not much of one. And with today's political and social climate, some of us are wondering if it's if going to the grocery store is even a good idea and others are, are are looking at the meat counter wondering why everything is so high priced and well that's if it's there at all so this is where we're seeing a shift everyone has seen their local farmers markets but 20 years ago a farmers market was pretty much unheard of or at least hard to find i got a cow chasing me i've got to cut her off here <laughs> hey no you can't come in here 
Hey, 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 hey. Knock it off. Get out. Go away. Don't be a turd. Hey. No, no, no. They knocked over my bucket of grain, too. That's supposed to be going towards the chickens. She's mad at me back there. Okay, where was I? Farmer's markets. Now you can't go outside without tripping over a farmer's market. And the same thing is happening with local food producers. More and more small farms and ranches are actually taking a step back, learning from the past and doing something that's what I consider a gift uh, to your community, allowing them to eat local and enjoy where their food comes from. Now, I guess unless you're at a farmer's market in Costa Rica, maybe a banana might be hard to find, but local food will surprise you. And as a consumer, you're doing, you're doing a good thing, supporting local farmers and ranchers. It actually strengthens your community, not to mention uh, your local economy. Farmers who sell direct to consumers receive on average 80 cents of every dollar. Local food is also in season. So talk about, you know, peak flavor and nutrition. Uh, the average fruit or vegetable on your plate from the grocery store has 1,500 miles under its belt. In fact, food at this point is probably more well-traveled than, than you are. So buy local, take a vacation, see the world, and eat their food while you're at it. Buying local is also an investment. Look at it this way. When bad things happen, like we all know they can, especially when you go to the grocery store and shelves are, are empty, who are we really going to rely on? We saw it right here at our farm store where people we'd never met came and actually bought us out and we weren't ready for it. So here's the best reason to buy local. I want everybody to know where their food comes from. You don't have to buy every little thing from a farmer's market or a, a local grower. But a regular trip out to a farm or a ranch or even a farmer's market is the best way to connect to your food and that rooster. Now, you get to meet with farmers. You get to talk to them. You get to talk to them about how the food's produced and, and why it's important um, for them to give you the best. And Aaron will even tell you how to cook it and give you recipes. <laughs> So if you are a farmer or rancher who's thinking about selling directly to the end consumer, my suggestion is do it. Don't sit back. Don't come up with a plan. Don't come up with reasons not to. Just do it. Take your eggs to your spouse's place of work and sell them to their coworkers. Uh, get them hooked on fresh eggs. It's kind of a, uh, a gateway food. And if you're looking at getting into farming and or ranching, maybe think differently. Don't think big. Think smaller and direct to the consumer. That may be your best ticket right now. Another thing I hear is I don't know how to find local food. Well, here's a website, localharvest.org. Go there, put in your address, and you'll be surprised how many local people there are selling food. If you sell local food, get listed. And I'm sure there's tons of other websites out there that can help you do it um, and help you buy and support local foods, growers, ranchers, and farmers. Because I really think that's what it's all about, helping each other. I've never met a farmer or a rancher who wants to be rich. I've met hundreds who want to work and provide for others. Say the same thing about big corporations who want you to buy their food for your table. Guys, I got to run. Lots to do. But uh, really think about it. You don't have to spend your entire food budget at a farm store or a farmer's market. But I guarantee what you do spend will be worth it. Thanks for listening to me. Take a minute. Like this video. Subscribe if you would like to come along for whatever we're doing. And learn more about where your food is really does come from and how it ends up on your plate. Localharvest.org, not a sponsor of this video, but we are supported by FBN, Farmers Business Network, putting farmers and ranchers together across the U.S. and working to create a future of farming that puts farmers and ranchers first. That's important. Check them out at FBN.com. We'll see you next time. Until then, have a great week. And thanks for being a part of our Wyoming life.